Hello friends, my name is Amit and today we will discuss the short story The Enemy by Pearl S. Buck. So this is from the supplementary reader in English for class 12, Vistas. And um, Pearl S. Buck or Pearl Sidney Stricker Buck who lived between 1892 and 1973 is one of the most important novelists, um, short story writers of the 20th century also a Nobel Prize winner, the first American woman to um, win the Nobel Prize in 1938, in fact. So let us um, get into the story, but before that the objectives. So through this story, we will try to understand the short story form, understand the war narratives, we shall try to understand the ideas of stereotyping, humanism, nationalism, we shall try to understand how literature opens channels to cultural, historical and psychological knowledge domains as well. So let's have a look at the summary of the story first. The story is about this character called Sadao Haki, um, a Japanese doctor. Sadao Haki grew up in a small coastal village of Japan where he spent an idyllic childhood with the ocean and the pine trees. He would climb up the pine trees like the coconut climbers of the South Seas as you can um, see in this picture and as you would have seen several coconut um, climbers in various parts of coastal India as well. Sadao's father was a visionary. He said, those islands yonder, they are the stepping stones to the future for Japan. Sadao asked, where shall we step from them? And the father answered, who knows, who can limit our future? It depends on what we make it. So friends, Remember these islands and they will come back in the story. And it's, it's a very interesting kind of a conversation happening between father and son where the island is a metaphor that they live on this little island but these are the islands of the future that even from a small place if you have a dream you can make it big. The father's focus was Sadao's education, um, sends him to USA to become a surgeon Sadao returns as an astute surgeon and a scientist researching on how to render wounds entirely clean. At this point, we are introduced to Hannah, Sadao's wife and their two children. Sadao had met Hannah at Professor Harley's house when he lived in America, which was purely a chance meeting. The professor was boring, Sadao didn't want to go to the house. He went there and he found this Japanese girl who he fell in love with. Um, so I quote from the text, he had waited to fall in love with her until he was sure she was Japanese. This is a very interesting quote um, um, from the text which shows how traditional Sadao is despite being trained in the most modern surgery. That he wanted to make sure that she's pure blood Japanese, that she's not half, half American, that she knows all the Japanese traditions etc. This is also something that we have to keep in mind for later um, discussion. They had come back to Japan, taken the consent of Sadao's father and been married in the traditional manner. So despite having lived in US, both Sadao and Hana waited to come back to Japan, um, seek the father's blessing, approval and then got married. The context and the characters having been established, now the plot starts moving. They were perfectly happy and then the plot suddenly takes a turn. She laid her cheek against his arm. It was at this moment that both of them saw something black come out of the mists. It was a man. He was flung out of the ocean. So there is a dramatic twist um, in the plot over here while um, their love affair and their marriage is being discussed and the narrative is moving in a rather plain manner when suddenly a man is flung out of the sea. The backdrop of the story is World War II when Japan was at war with America. So as you would know from your history classes, there were the allies and the Axis powers, Japan was on the side of the Axis powers and America was on the side of the allies. Japan had bombed the Pearl Harbor in Hawaii in 1941 and USA later dropped the nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. So that's the backdrop to this um, short story. The man in question who has been swept to the shore by the sea is an American Navy soldier and has several wounds on his body including that of a bullet. He is possibly a prisoner of war who has escaped. What shall we do with this man? Sadao muttered. But his trained hands seemed of their own will to be doing what they could do to stanch the fearful bleeding. It's very interesting 
um, here that on the one hand Sadao is confused about what to do with this man for Japan is at war with America and Japanese are supposed to hate the Americans but at the same time as a doctor he is seeing a patient in front of him and of his, without his volition, without his wanting his hands start moving uh, to check out his wound and to um, stall the bleeding. Um, at this point I would like to point out this very interesting essay by D. H. Lawrence uh, which is called Why the Novel Matters where um, he says amongst other things that we give a lot of primacy to our mind, to our brain but there are various body parts act on their own that we have a subconscious, we have a deeper mind which, which operates within us and so despite his conscious brain saying that this is an American you are supposed to hate him, he is a prisoner of war um, his unconscious brain as a doctor and as a human being wants to save this man. Um, so the couple, Sadao and Hannah, confirm um, that they should put him back into the sea for they would be arrested if they tended to him and if he were turned as a prisoner he would most certainly die. Sadao hesitated, I care nothing for me, he is my enemy, all Americans are my enemy and he is only a common fellow. You see how foolish his face is, but since he is wounded. And this um, part shows the inner conflict in the mind of Sadao, the anxiety and the inadequacy of language that what we overtly say, our deeper minds may be saying something else. So overtly he is trying to say that as a Japanese he is supposed to hate an American, but as a doctor he knows his duty and as a human being also he knows his empathy. The couple take him home and Hannah cries out in fear, don't try to save him, what if he should live? What if he should die? Sadao replied. And after a while Hannah says, do you mean die from the operation? Um, so this is a very interesting use of language where the limits of language are being pushed, where a simple play on words builds tension in the plot and demonstrates the inner conflict of characters. So you see that the two simple words here used are live and die. So as Japanese people, as Japanese patriots, they are supposed to wish this American soldier death and so Hannah asks him what if he should live? They would be castigated by their own government by then. And Sadao says, but what if he should die? Which is the doctor inside him and the human empathy inside him speaking. But Hannah plays upon it. Uh, because they are afraid of um, this man surviving and then they would be indicted for harboring um, a spy, a prisoner. And so she says, you mean die from the operation. So even though she also wants the prisoner to live, um, she does a turn of phrase and, you mean, and says, you mean die in the operation. The servants are wary and anxious. Of course, they would also be pulled in by the army and the police if they got to know that they are hiding this prisoner and wish that the white man dies. Hannah doesn't want to wash the white man. Yumi, the servant, refuses to clean the wounds and eventually Hannah has to do the job. Sadao focuses on the operation despite Hannah almost fainting and is able to revive the man because he's a brilliant surgeon. This man, he thought, there is no reason under heaven why he should live. Unconsciously, this thought made him ruthless and he proceeded swiftly. I am not doing this for my own pleasure. In fact, I do not know why I am doing it. And once again, we can see the battle between the conscious mind and the subconscious. This reverberates throughout the story in the minds of both Sadao and Hana. The patient revives slowly. The servants leave the house in fear. And because the servants leave, Hannah has to do the household chores and take care of the baby and the patient both. And the young man, the young American man, lives in fear whether he would be turned over to the Japanese army. Sadao doesn't give him any assurance either what would happen with him. The plot takes a turn as Sadao is summoned by a military general. Thankfully, it is about the general's ailment and not about the American soldier. The plot twists again as we get to know that the general actually is aware of the American's presence. However, he would not arrest Sadao as Sadao has to perform an operation on him. Sadao is indispensable to the general. So the general should ideally punish him because he is harboring an American soldier, but at the same time Sadao is the surgeon who is 
uh, going to perform surgery on the general and so he is confused. The general offers to solve this problem by sending assassins at night who would execute the American as also remove his body. And so we see here that Sadao and Hana of course want the goodwill, uh, the well-being of the American soldier but at the same time they cannot take on the uh, Japanese military and they would have to give up the American soldier. Sadao waits anxiously for the assassins to turn up and is unable to sleep. The assassins do not turn up on the first night, do not turn up on the second night, do not turn up on the third night either. And Sadao is unable to sleep. And at this point, Sadao finally makes up his mind to help the American escape. Sadao plans an escape for Tom, the soldier. He arranges a boat on which he keeps food and water and asks Tom to sail to the small island visible from the shore of the village. The island is unguarded and Korean fishing boats pass by it. Koreans are allies of Americans and they would save the poor soldier. I realize you are saving my life again, he told Sadao. So Sadao has saved his life twice, once when he performed the surgery on him and fostered him in his house and this time when he's arranging a boat for him. Sadao doesn't abandon him even at this moment. He tells the soldier that he should flash the flashlight at dusk if he has run out of supplies. And then the story moves back to the military general. Sadao performs the operation on the general successfully. The general apologizes for forgetting about the matter of assassins and says that he was self-absorbed about his illness and Sadao should not consider it a dereliction of duty. So the general is also building alibis for not sending the assassins. And this is a strange twist in the tale that the general is making excuses and he is also afraid that he may be pulled up for not having killed the American. And so we see this strange empathy in the military general as well for this young American soldier. And this is where roughly the story ends with Sadao remembering the prejudices against him by Americans when he lived in America. His landlady was despicable but had tended to him when he had influenza and yet she remained repulsive to him. And so was this soldier repulsive to um, Sadao. That's what he thinks. So the story ends with, strange he thought, I wonder why I could not kill him. So friends, as you can see that this is... Um, very interesting thriller. It's a very long story, runs into about 40 pages in this um, book and there's no substitute to actually reading the story um, or having read it being read out in a, in a classroom. So you should read it a, a few times um, because the story is about inner conflicts in the minds of Sadao, his wife, the military general. It's about this battle between common perception and what your heart says and um, there is a lot of play of language as we have already seen with a few examples um, and so there is no substitute to actual reading of the text. Let us look at some of the extracts to see um, the skill uh, with which Pearl S. Bucks uh, writes and how effective um, um, her writing is. So we will look at the craft of her writing now. So we will look at some extracts. The first extract is, but he had gone there and he had found Hana, a new student, and he had felt he would love her if it were at all possible. Now this is very interesting. Look at the brevity of the language, the hint in it, and the way Pearl Buck questions the idea of love. That Sadao does not fall in love with her at first sight. He does, but he does not. If it were at all possible. And so he has to find out that if she's properly Japanese, that she's not Japanese American or she believes in Japanese traditions, only after that he would be able to fall in love with her. So Pearl Buck here is questioning the idea of love at first sight, which is often repeated uh, in literature and in films as you would have seen. Let's look at the second extract. The sand on one side of him had already a stain of red soaking through. So this is the time when Tom the soldier washes up on the shore. So the narrative does not talk about blood directly but through this visual effect of sand getting um, stained 
um, with red. The next extract is a white man, Hannah whispered. Yes, it was a white man. The wet cap fell away and there was his wet yellow hair, long, as though for many weeks it had not been cut and upon his young and tortured face was a rough yellow beard. He was unconscious and knew nothing that they did for him. It's a beautiful description of the young man, his travails, um, how haggard he is, um, having gone through um, torture and having gone through the ravages of the sea. And the last line beautifully um, shows the relationship that's developing between this couple and him. He was unconscious and knew nothing that they did for him. So they are going to do something for him, but he's unconscious and he would know only later. The next extract. Together they lifted the man. He was very light, like a fowl that had been half starved for a long time until his, its only feathers and skeleton. It's a very interesting metaphor, uh, a simile that has been um, used where the man is compared to a fowl that is half starved. And so, of course, a man is not as light as a fowl or a rooster. Um, but the comparison uh, draws home the point and emphasizes of how weak he's become. The next extract. The master ought not to heal the wound of this white man. He, the gardener, said bluntly to Hannah, the white man ought to die. First he was shot. Then the sea caught him and wounded him with her rocks. If the master heals, what the gun did and what the sea did, they will take revenge on us. This is a strange superstition that the gardener has, that if a man has been ravaged by both man and ocean, nature, he is doomed to die. So it's a debate between destiny and will. That this man is destined to die, everybody wants him to die, the war wants him to die, the ocean wants him to die except that it's Sadao's will to save him, a doctor's will, a skilled surgeon's will to save him. On the other hand, it's also a matter of interpretation. If this man is suffering from a bullet wound, from torture wounds, and if he's been ravaged by the sea and he's still alive, it's actually his destiny to stay alive. Um, and so, how the same thing can be interpreted in two ways, this is a very good example of that. And as readers, we must pay attention to this. The next extract. She, Hannah, did not wish to be left alone with the white man. He was the first she had seen since she had left America. And now he seemed to have nothing to do with those whom she had known there. Here, he was her enemy, a menace, living or dead. So Hannah has lived in America as well. But now that Japan is at war with America, she has forgotten or wants to forget her, her American experience. And like Sadao, she must also have suffered from prejudices against her. That is not clear in the text. But she is very resolute. And wherever this uh, narrative voice comes, the third person narrative voice which commands the story, the, the narrator of the story, um, the narrator tends to read the voice of both Sadao and Hana as overwhelmingly Japanese and so she thinks of this man as a menace, living or dead. Uh, living he is much more of a menace because they would be punished for harboring a spy, a prisoner of war. So this is also about the trauma and hatred caused by war. This raises issues of nationalism, how narrow nationalism makes us think in a certain way. The next extract. She wondered for a moment if it mattered to him what was the body upon which he worked so long as it was the work he did so excellently. This extract is about Sadao's skill as a surgeon and to him it does not matter whether it's an American body or a Japanese body. As a surgeon, he is just delighted to have a human body to work upon. That's his skill as a surgeon to cut open a human body and heal it. The next extract, um, the eighth extract is watching him. She wondered if the stories they had sometimes heard of the sufferings of prisoners were true. They came like flickers of rumor, told by word of mouth 
and always contradicted. In the newspapers, the reports were always that wherever the Japanese armies went, the people received them gladly with cries of joy at their liberation. But sometimes she remembered such men as General Takima, who at home beat his wife cruelly, though no one mentioned it now, that he had so victorious in battle in Manchuria. If a man like that could be so cruel to a woman in his power, would he not be cruel to one like this, for instance? This is a very interesting insertion into the story where it takes a gendered dimension that we are talking about men, we are talking about prisoners of war, Japanese military, American military, the second world war, but we are not seeing it from the point of view of women and which is where a woman writer's intervention is very important and interesting. And also the idea of torture. So Hannah sees some wounds on the American soldier's um, neck and she thinks if it is torture, if he was tortured by the Japanese soldiers. And look again here at, at how these things work. They came like flickers of rumor, told by word of mouth. So you always hear about these things um, in forms of rumors, uh, but they are always contradicted by official reports. So the official reports, of course, want to keep the whole scene sanitized um, and in a certain usage of language uh, that does not let the horrors of war reach people. And so it is always about the glory and romance of war, never about the horrors. But wars are nothing but horror. There are no winners in war, they are only losers, whichever side wins. So the newspapers would always obviously praise the army and the soldiers, how people received them gladly. But at the same time, Hana remembers that General Takima used to beat his wife cruelly at home and nobody mentioned it now. It was known earlier. Now that he was victorious in the battle in Manchuria, nobody cared about what Takima did to his wife. And so Hana thinks that if a man like him could be cruel to a powerless woman, what would he do to a soldier in his captivity? And this is a serious food for thought in this um, story. The next extract, ignorance of human body is the surgeon's cardinal sin, sirs. He, that is Professor Sadao's professor of anatomy, had thunder at his classes year after year. To operate without as complete knowledge of the body as if you have made it, anything less than that is murder. Again, look at the use of the metaphor over here, that if a surgeon does not know the body as if he himself were the maker, as if he himself were God who has created the body. If he does not know it like that, then he has no right to be a surgeon, then he is murdering his uh, patient. But I have uh, chosen this extract to show the usage uh, of language, how um, uh, Buck uses uh, metaphors to great effect. So the last extract is, suppose you were condemned to death, in the next day I had to have my operation. This is the general speaking to Sadao when he summons him first. The other surgeons, Excellency, Sadao suggested. None I trust, the general replied. The best ones have been trained by the Germans and would consider the operation successful even if I died. I do not care for their point of view, he sighed. It seems a pity that we cannot better combine the German ruthlessness with the American sentimentality. Then you could turn your prisoner over to execution and yet I could be sure you would not murder me while I was unconscious. The general laughed. He had an unusual sense of humor. As a Japanese, could you not combine these two foreign elements, he asked. It's one of the most interesting conversations um, in the short story where the general talks of German ruthlessness. Uh, in fact, Germany is the ally of Japan in this war. Uh, and so it's clear that he's talking about Nazis and Hitler and how ruthless they were uh, in the in their project of Holocaust and persecution of um, Jews of Germany and Eastern um, Europe. And uh, he also talks about American sentimentality. And uh, so it's very strange that while you're talking about Japanese nationalism um, and everything that should be homegrown. At, 
and yet the general is talking about imports that Sadao should import German ruthlessness to hand over the prisoner and he should show American sentimentality in treating him and that is the joke that he is um, cracking over here this is something to ponder upon. So friends we had a discussion about the short story The Enemy by Pearl S. Buck today. Um, we went through the summary in detail, had some discussion points about it, we saw some extracts and had further discussion points about it. So this is uh, this much for this session and in the next session we will have a more detailed discussion about the story, themes, questions, um, points to ponder upon etc. So thank you for being with me and see you in the next session.